Walking is something most of us do without giving it a single thought. But for some people, it is more difficult than expected. I'm trying to help these people, and I might use something unexpected to help me out. Can music help physical rehabilitation? Vanuit Hongaar 3020 in Herend is dit de Universiteit van Vlaanderen. Oké, okay. so please clap along with me. Okay. Okay. So what happened there? You listened to my rhythm, and then you made a mental map of where the beats were in time. Yeah, bum, 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 bum. So you made a mental map of where these beats were in time, and then you produced these beats by clapping. So what you did is you aligned your claps to, let's say, these mental maps. You used prediction and anticipation processes to do that. And then I introduced a second rhythm, and everyone noticed, because you stopped. What happened? That was because your prediction and anticipation processes said, wait, hold on, stop, there's something wrong. What you were clapping and what you were hearing were not the same. So what you had to do, or what you were doing at that moment, you were clapping to the mental map of your first rhythm that I clapped to. So you had to break that mental map and create a new one for the second rhythm. And then you had to use your motor output, in this case, the claps, in order to realign and after a few claps, after you got this alignment, you synchronized with me. This is a process of auditory motor coupling, also called sensory motor synchronization. It's a very, very rich process, but it's not straightforward because all these pieces, all these different processes that I'm described right now have to be done in a perfect harmony, just as in an overall piece of a puzzle. But it is also innate. Have you ever caught yourself tapping your foot when listening to a good song? For example, when you're waiting for somebody in a bar. Some people even use this in everyday life. Who goes for a run here? Running? Yes. And who does so with music in their ears? Okay. Some people, not a lot, but <laughs> okay. Have you noticed also when you run Sometimes you pick up speed as the music also goes faster. You spontaneously synchronize. So this is an innate ability, but it's not that straightforward. So why is all this relevant? Why are we talking about this today? Well, one context is physiotherapy. This is a paramedical profession. And some of you might have encountered physiotherapists um, after having a sports injury. So you go to a physiotherapy, a physiotherapist, they might help you with the pain and they might help you to regain function again and also to maybe get back to the sports that you were doing. So get you back into shape. Well, I'm also a physiotherapist, but my background and specialty is in neurological rehabilitation. And in my capacity as a rehabilitation scientist, what I do is that I'm interested to study a human movement interaction and then try to propose evidence-based solutions for physical rehabilitation. So you can see how auditory motor coupling could be interesting for me, because it provides an opportunity for one of these evidence-based solutions. But it needs to be studied. And that is what I did in universities of Hasselt and in Ghent, in the laboratories of my professors, Peter Fees and Mark Lehmann. I investigated this with multiple sclerosis, or in short, MS. So, what is MS? It's a neurological disorder or a neurological disease where walking impairments and fatigue, among other symptoms, require managing. And so this was my focus. What I did was I tried to investigate if coupling steps to beats would improve walking and would have an effect on fatigue in this population. So I set up experiments, and these, in these experiments, uh, we used custom-made softwares where we gave participants headphones to put them on in order to listen to the auditory stimuli that we were going to give them. And we, um, we also worked with sensors. 
We place these sensors, these are portable sensors, watch-like strap sensors on the feet, and thereafter we can really measure when the person is walking, how they're walking, the steps they take, uh, um, if they go faster and slower and so on. So we ask our participants to walk to music. So it looked like this. So they had to hear the beats and walk to it. Okay. Then we also ask them to walk to metronomes. And it looked like this. And then we try to investigate if changing the tempo of the music or the metronomes also affected their walking and synchronization, such as this. What the study showed, what the results showed, that the majority of persons with MS were actually able to synchronize to, to the beats in music and the ticks and metronomes. And also, we saw that they were able to change their walking pattern. So they did change their steps per minute in order to reach these beats per minute. So we hypothesized that this is most probably the effect of this auditory motor coupling, the processes that I, I explained. So they really engage in this process, which is a positive thing. We also found a superior effect of music compared to the metronomes. I, I mentioned that we had two experimental conditions. One was music and one was metronomes. And we saw that walking to music um, decreased perceived fatigue, so patients were feeling less fatigued when coupling to music. And secondly, their quality of the movement, so their walking was more natural. And when walking to metronomes, it was more rigid. We can explain these, let's say, superior effects of music um, with several uh, thoughts. The first is, studies have shown that when we listen to music, we have reward pathways in our in our brains that is activated. And these reward pathways most probably are why music produces a superior effect. A second reason is this concept called music agency. What is this? This is the feeling of control. When you're listening and you're activated while doing something with music, you are in control of your movement, you're in control of your behavior, and this by itself promotes motivation. Thirdly, you have emotion that is associated to music. Who listens to music and has no emotion to it? You might feel happy, you might feel sad, you might feel confused, but you have a certain emotion. And this we can really capitalize in rehabilitation, especially when we're dealing with rehabilitating persons for very long periods of time. So this is quite an engaging concept. And the fourth aspect is cognitive load. This is an aspect that has been investigated more. And what we propose in our research is that when somebody synchronizes to music, it could be more forgiving. Why? Because of the salient structures of the beats in the music allows it to do so. And consider, when you walk to metronomes, you immediately hear each beat. And therefore, if you miss a beat, you have to immediately realign and resynchronize. And this creates a harshness in the quality of the movement and also in the cognitive load. So what did we learn from the study? We learned that, okay, this is a very promising tool to use, right? But, there's always a but when we are doing research, it's because we also saw variability in our sample. So what does this mean? Although the majority of the participants were able to synchronize consistently, I saw that there were a few that had a variety of synchronization levels. And the question is why? Because this is very important to answer before we go to clinical practice. And I hypothesize that this why is due to a compromise of one of the pieces of the overall puzzle that we discussed. Is it really the perceptual aspects? Is it the motor aspects? Is it the prediction and anticipatory aspects? Is it their interplays or are there components that is not yet there in that piece of the puzzle? So my current work aims to test that hypothesis. And in order to do that, we've set up further experimentation with a few important points of uh, attention. The first is I widened the neurological population that could participate in the study. 
So now we include participants with higher impairment levels, physical or cognitive, or also timing and coordination disorders to really understand the timing effects in, this, uh, in, the, in the overall puzzle. Then I specify the tasks. Now I include a finger tapping task. So persons have to tap to the beats that they hear. And this would allow me to have more of a controlled setting in order to study sensory motor or auditory motor coupling. And then we also have the walking tasks. And the walking tasks are there because this is the most clinically relevant, of course. So persons, again, have to uh, walk to certain rhythms. Moreover, I pay specific attention to the auditory stimuli that I give, so to these rhythms. So we don't only give them music or metronomes as they are. What we do is we manipulate these rhythms. We manipulate these auditory structures. So we shift the beats left and right. We stretch the songs or we shrink the songs in order to really see what happens. How, how is the person reacting to this? How are they interacting? And yeah, in order to do this, I work with an excellent engineer, Dr. Bart Mons, who creates my own custom-made softwares in order for me to design rhythms for them to do what I want them to do, which is excellent. So yeah, and finally, of course, is the measuring. And one thing we can measure is what we see, right? So we are listening to music, we're synchronizing to music, and we're moving. And I mentioned before, I use sensors. So with these sensors, I can really measure what we see. Synchronization, how movement changes, and so on. But what we still couldn't measure was what's happening in the brain. Because this is very important also. This is a response of synchronization that we cannot see. We call this non-overt response. And in order to do this, I collaborated uh, with, with another colleague, a neuroscientist, Mattia Rosso, and we used the EEG. This is, if I can just do this. So this is a cap of an EEG. And what it does is you have sensors underneath this cap, which you put in the head of a person. And with software and equipment, we're able to measure the brain activity of a person. So what we did with my colleague, we came up with a methodological solution to analyze these brain signals in order to, to measure these signals that were oscillating in the brain that were attuned to the rhythmic stimuli frequency. So now, what that means is we're able to also measure what's happening in the brain while we synchronize, during synchronization. So where am I at the moment? I have all the different pieces of the puzzle that I need to start these investigations. And that's where I am. I am. The end goal, of course, is to use these evidence-based solutions in clinical rehabilitation. But first, we need to understand the why and the how people synchronize. This way, we can really target individuality, tailor-made rehabilitation. We look at efficacy and focusing on specific impairments. So we have to unlock one door at a time. And by doing this, we are really are able to use this treasure we internationally call music. Luckily, I work for two great bosses that really foster my independent research pursuits. So I will have answers to these questions for you soon enough, so do stay tuned. But next time you go for a run with music or you go to a concert, I invite you to reflect on this innate tendency to synchronize and consider what can, what can scientific advancements of understanding these processes do for those with neurological impairments. Thank you. Thank you.